Um, thanks for those thoughts, James. Very interesting indeed. I'm going to um, basically be going through some of those points, uh, trying to respond to uh, some of my own thoughts. Uh, so first of all, naturalistic ethics are the moral ontology point. Non-moral good is what we would want, what we would want our, ourselves to want if we were perfectly rationally informed. Moral good is maximizing this from a social point of view. Um, to talk about non-moral good feels like a contradiction to me. Uh, Oxford Dictionary defines moral, one of these definitions, examining the nature of ethics and foundation of good and bad, character and conduct. And good is possessing or displaying moral virtue. So to talk about non-moral good kind of feels like, let's talk about the non-number seven or the non-colour blue. Kind of a contradiction. But I think what is meant, if I'm not mistaken, by um, Railton's non-moral good is essentially moral feelings. Yeah, what we would want, ideally, if it's, a, it's a moral feeling kind of thing. And uh, as I understand it, Railton defines X is morally right if and only if X would be approved by an ideally instrumentally rational, fully informed agent, considering the question how best to maximise the amount of non-moral good as people's moral feelings. Right? We want to maximise as many people's moral feelings as possible from a social point of view in which the interests of all potentially affected individuals were counted equally. Uh, maybe I'm missing something. I don't see how this is not... I don't see how this is different from majority rule. If there are 10,000 people in Nazi Germany who their moral feelings is that the Jews should be exterminated and there's 1,000 Jews whose moral feelings are that the Jews shouldn't be exterminated, if we're going to uh, maximise the interests of the potentially affected individuals, you have 10,000 here and 1,000 here, it, it feels like majority rule, which I don't think we would say is a good basis for ethics. Uh, the no ought from an is objection needed to add a moral premise to make the argument valid. Uh, so we saw, I think we agree here that um, premise one, murder is killing innocent, premise two, killing innocent, deprives them of life, uh, therefore conclusion, we ought not to murder, that's invalid, right? You can't get an ought from two is statements. Uh, the proposed valid argument is, is adding a premise three, we ought not to cause unnecessary suffering, therefore we ought not to mur murder. This obviously isn't an ought from an is, it's an ought from another ought. Right? Premise three is an ought, you're assuming an ought in the, the argument itself. And I think Arthur Left is saying, well, premise three, we ought not to cause unnecessary suffering, it says who? Says me, says you, says them, who's... I, like, and for this argument to work, if we're talking to people who we disagree about murder, they're not going to agree with these premises. They're going to say, premise one, who's innocent? Premise two, who, who says that this suffering is unnecessary? Like, it's... Uh, it feels like it's um, basically... To say that moral statements are statements of fact uh, about good and interest and beneficial, it really comes back to the question, good for who? Beneficial for who? Whose interests are we talking about? How do you define what's good? Uh, earlier this year, I had a debate with a professional philosopher in the States. He's got his PhD and he's, he's writing a textbook on philosophy. And he, he basically, I think he cuts through this argument fairly well. He says, I don't see any moral realism position that adequately answers the is or divide without merely hand waving. Like this is the, the meta-ethical equivalent of saying, look over there, aha, and what? Like it's, it just doesn't follow from an easy. And I think this is essentially the key in the debate. If you could demonstrate how you can get an ought from an is, then I would concede the debate. I would say James has definitely demonstrated how you can say that this is not permitted without God. But I, I really haven't seen how you can overcome an ought from an is. I think many people have tried and failed, but yeah, if you could, that'd be great. And, and we'd you know, write a whole new branch of ethics, I guess. Uh, moral epistemology justified this account of morality by its explanatory power and avoidance of non weird physical entities, no moral truths from studying the natural world. Well, this is essentially saying that you know, the naturalistic fallacy isn't a fallacy or, or trying to avoid it or you know, somehow getting around it. And, and I see a lot of contradictions in people's ethics that try and do this. So, for example, Peter Singer, Melbourne's own ethicist, uh, he wrote a book, A Darwinian Left Politics, Evolution and Cooperation where he begins by saying, you cannot get an ought from an is, right? The naturalistic fallacy is actually a fallacy. But then he says, cooperation is genetic. We're genetically conditioned to cooperate, therefore we ought to be directed by our genetic dispositions. Like, that's just committing the fallacy that he says is a fallacy. He's saying, you're getting an ought from an is. And his whole system of ethics is based on this contradiction. Why would you say we should be directed by our genetic predispositions towards cooperation? Why not our genetic predispositions towards selfishness? Richard Dawkins has made an excellent case in the selfish gene theory that we're selfish. You know. Why cooperation rather than selfishness? It's kind of arbitrary. 
Uh, moral motivation. Reason to be moral because if you are, more human desires will be fulfilled and there'll be more human flourishing, good enough to be morally competent. I think I agree largely on this, mainly because desires and motivation are pretty close. But whose moral desires? The majority? Whose definition of human flourishing? Yours, my, whose competence? Is? How do we decide that? Uh, Alistair McIntyre wrote a 400 page book, Whose Justice, Which Rationality? Like, what makes you think that you're rational and everyone who disagrees with you is irrational? You still left with the question, how do you define good? Uh, the amoral subjection, human, human the, sorry, Hume's theory of motivation, no possible to desire, independent motivating reason can be given for anything. So then, whose desires or moral feelings ought to trump everybody else's? What are you pointing to to adjudicate between our competing moral feelings? Whose definition of moral flourishing? People define moral flourishing in radically different ways. That's what ethical debates are about. Is this flourishing or not? Uh, for theistic ethics, uh, the Euphro dilemma is basically asking the question, moral realism or moral relativism, right? Is, does God call it good because it is good, moral realism, or is it good because God calls it good, moral relativism? And now, the, asking the question isn't really giving the answer. It's very, very different. And the biblical authors, I uh, think especially the psalmists, they don't assume that God is good. Oh, God, you've done this, it must be good because you did it. They conclude that God is good based on what he has done. It's not outside of God, because according to theism, at least Christian theism, God has created a moral universe. It's part of his, he created it, whether he's good or evil. Uh, defining goodness problem, saying that God is good, becomes an empty tautology, no explanatory power. Well, at least, in the Bible at least, God isn't defined to be good. We're invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34, verse 8. Jesus says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down his life for his friends. He, Jesus, tells us, shows us, and moves us to do the good. Uh, moral epistemology, no goodness because God, by his very nature, consults his revealed word for specific moral issues. Uh, not heaps of disagreement on this one, maybe in a legalistic Judaism, but uh, Christianity looks to the person and work of Jesus. He is the ultimate example of what is good. Recognizing the goodness problem, impossible to say whether Jesus is good and worthy of worship because there is no external standard to compare to, I feel like at this point you're not really engaging with theism as theism. You're engaging as if God is one voice among many. You're not letting God be God. You're kind of demanding that he be like us. He's not the creator of a moral universe. He's just one other voice in a relativistic universe. That's not really theism. Well, at least it's not Christian theism or, or any other theism that I know. It's kind of maybe one of our imaginations. But it, it's kind of assuming moral relativism and then trying to fit God in that. I don't think it works. Uh, moral motivation, God is self-evidently worthy of following. Um, I'm not sure, sure the Bible authors agree with that. They're more arguing that it's the cross that moves us to love others. Uh, 1 John 4, we love because he first loved us. And uh, the amoralist problem has no better answer than the amoralist, than the naturalist. Uh, let me just kind of close with uh, two examples that I think, um, well for me at least highlight why that's not the case. Uh, there was a, an anthropologist, um, she studied at NYU and then went to Africa as an anthropologist. She wrote a piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education. When she went to Africa, she saw uh, women sold into sexual slavery, she saw genital mutilation, and she goes to the governments to try and change this, to try and bring good into the country. And the government said, well, you see that as sexual slavery, that's not how we see it. And she says, I've always believed that human values are socially constructed, but what I'm seeing in Africa is evil. There is no objective basis for human rights within an atheistic worldview, but I'm going to continue to fight for human rights anyway. <coughs> See, she sees the contradiction, but she says, I'm just not going to think about it. I'm going to keep doing good, but I'm just not going to think about it. Uh, by contrast, uh, an atheist by the name of Matthew Paris wrote a piece in the Sunday Times a while ago. This is another atheist reflecting on things in Africa. He wrote a piece called, As an Atheist, I Truly Believe Africa Needs God. In which he says this, Now... A confirmed atheist, I've become convinced that the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa, sharply distinct from the work of secular NGOs, government projects, and international aid efforts, these alone will not do. Education and training alone will not do. In Africa, Christianity changes people's hearts. It brings spiritual transformation. The rebirth is real. The change is good. This is an atheist. He is seeing what Christianity does. It shows you what good, what is good, what is evil, and it moves you to do the good. 